So welcome back, everyone. Oh my goodness, so nice to see so many folks here in the summertime. Um, my name is Dr. Pam Kastner. I have the honor of serving as Patent State Lead for Literacy. And this series, the patent uh, series celebrating the 20th anniversary of the publication of Dr. Hollis Scarborough's Reading Rope has just been such a wonderful series. This is the fifth session in the series. We were focusing on the lower ends of the rope for the last few months, but we're so very, very honored to have Dr. Vaughn um, leading us into the upper strands of the road with background knowledge this evening. Just a few little logistical things before we get started. If you are here and uh, um, choosing to have Act 48 Hours aligned with this series, it's very important that you change your name um, to your full name. That way we keep track of your attendance, as well as a form that you'll need to complete at the end of the series. You do not need to put your full name into the chat. All you need to do is to go up to your um, photo uh, in the upper right hand corner, there are three dots and just click on that right click and then rename yourself with your first name and your last name. If you're uh, seeking Act 48 hours. Each of these sessions is recorded and on a Padlet along with the handouts that are related to it. Um, I did place that information in the waiting room chat but I will place it in the chat um, in just a moment here as well. Uh, joining me, of course, in this series is a patent literacy team as well as the partner in the series is Nancy Hennessy is joining me in this series as well. Nancy is going to provide a brief bio of Dr. Vaughn, and then Dr. Vaughn will lead us in deepening our knowledge around background knowledge, but we will save time, as we always do each time, for questions, and I'll be uh, curating those from the chat. So thank you all again so very much for joining us this evening, and I'll turn it over to uh, Nancy Hennessy now. Thank you, Pam. Well, welcome, everyone. It really is my privilege and honor to introduce Dr. Sharon Vaughn. She is the Manuel J. Trustees Endowed Chair in Education at the University of Texas in Austin and the Executive Director at the Meadows Center for Preventing Educational Risk. Of course, she's the recipient of multiple awards, including the Distinguished Faculty and Research Award and the Council for Exceptional Children's Research Award. Sharon is the author of more than 35 books. I'm sure many of you have read them. 250 research articles, six of which um, met the criteria for the What Works Clearinghouse for Intervention Reports. Uh, we are very, very fortunate to have her with us this evening. She certainly um, has influenced so many of us in the field. So welcome, Sharon. Oh my gosh, thank you all so much. It's really a privilege and an honor to be here. Um, I admire so much what Patton has done in the state of Pennsylvania, and they've been just such a positive influence for professional development and enriching all of our knowledge as educators. So thank you for the model work you do. I admire all of you so much for coming to a session during the summer at this time. Um, you are really uh, my people, and I am so glad to be here with you. And I invite you, as I go through my presentation, please ask questions. I really like questions because they help me sort of keep track of what I'm not being clear about. Or make your own additions and share your own experiences. There's so much knowledge and expertise available in this uh, shared space that we have. And it would be really, um, I think, terrific for all of us to not just have your questions, but to have your uh, comments and connections. So with that in mind, I wanna start with a big woohoo, not just happy birthday, but happy a celebration for the 20 years of the Scarborough rope. And many of you have just seen this rope and you didn't know that actually somebody invented it. And Hollis Scarborough's um, conception of the way in which these strands are woven together to create a skilled reader so that we think about what many people refer to as the simple view of reading. And we think about how we have linguistic or language comprehension and we have word reading and word recognition and that the various components that go with each of these weave together to make um, proficient reading. And as we think about the area that I am going to be focusing on um, uh, in this talk, it's background knowledge. And as you look at the strands, and if you look at the reading rope, you'll see that background knowledge really fits under language comprehension. But the interesting thing is that background knowledge and vocabulary really go very close together. 
And in fact, vocabulary is really a proxy for background knowledge. And since background knowledge is so difficult to measure, we often measure background knowledge through vocabulary. So if I want to know what your background knowledge is before you read a passage, one of the best ways I can determine that is to pull key academic vocabulary or content vocabulary from that passage, see what you know about those words, and then that will give me my best indication of background knowledge. So today, I am going to talk about how this very important concept of background knowledge forms an essential element in the Scarborough rope that contributes to how we develop skilled reading. So they introduced me and I wasn't sure if I was gonna introduce myself. So um, I, I look better in this picture here on this slide. So I often show that because like most of us, we like the pictures where we look good. So I pulled that one and it makes me feel good to see it before I get started. So today's uh, focus, as I mentioned earlier, and uh, we talked about is really this idea of background knowledge as an essential feature in terms of learning to understand text. And that's the key thing. Background knowledge is the critical ingredient to understanding and comprehending text. Fundamentally, you could argue very successfully that there's only really two things you need to know. You know, need to know how to be able to read the words. That's not that simple, I understand that. And all the components that go with reading the words. And you need to know what the words mean and to have adequate background knowledge. And that yields comprehension. The work I'm gonna be talking about today related to background knowledge is work I've done with a bunch of colleagues. One of them is Jack Fletcher. I think he worked with Patton last year. Great guy, super funny, so smart, taught me so much. And really, if you don't wanna know what he thinks, don't ask him because he'll tell you, very direct. And then other research team too from around uh, various uh, universities who've contributed to my thinking. So here's the key points that I'm gonna make today. One of the points I'm gonna make is that we have been challenged to improve reading comprehension. And we've been talking about it for decades. What we refuse to accept is that reading comprehension is the product of word reading and background knowledge. If we have those two things really set, the likelihood that comprehension will occur is very high. The second point I'm gonna make is that there is explicit and implicit evidence-based reading instruction that is required for students to capitalize on their background knowledge to be a successful reader. The third thing I'm gonna talk about is that most reading comprehension based on background knowledge is inadequate. We inadequately address word reading and practice. And I put that in there, even though I'm talking about background knowledge, because you cannot background knowledge yourself to comprehension. You have to have word reading. And one of the best ways to build background knowledge is practice reading. So word reading and world knowledge, in other words, word reading and background knowledge equal reading comprehension. Okay, so reading comprehension um, instruction today, we know that there are these observation studies that have been done as long as 40 years ago, Dolores Durkin shared her work with us that basically this deep reading comprehension that addresses background knowledge is really the essential missing element after second and third grade and that students lack adequate opportunities to practice. When I say practice, I mean practice reading words, phrases, sentences, connected text, extended text. Without the opportunities to do those things, students will lack reading comprehension. So I'm gonna shift gears for a second. 
I have to take these photos off my screen because I have all these people on my screen. I can't see my own PowerPoint. So shifting gears a second, we have conduct conducted more than 40 randomized control trials, all of them taking into account how we can use background knowledge to improve reading comprehension. And I'm gonna focus most of these on grades four to nine. And you may say, well, why grades four to nine? Isn't background knowledge important in grades kindergarten, first, second, and third? And the answer is absolutely yes. The reason I'm focusing on grades four through nine is that the emphasis in grades K-1-2 is on word reading, fluency, and the things that contribute to that, such as phonics, phonemic awareness, et cetera. What becomes more important, so as a figure ground, what becomes increasingly important in grades three and up is the ideas of not, word reading doesn't go away, but of increasing importance are these complex vocabulary words and background knowledge. So if you're reading a simple sentence like, the man was on the chair, he asked for more food, the wife said, there is food in the refrigerator, go get it. The background knowledge needed for these rather simply lack complex texts that characterize much of the text up to about second grade is minimal. But after that, background knowledge becomes extremely important. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about these randomized controlled trials that help us better understand the role of background knowledge. So if you look at effect sizes, an effect size is a measure of impact. It tells you the extent to which the treatment that is being presented was associated with improved outcomes in the population of students studied. In these effect sizes, this is across students with reading difficulties, not typical learners. And students with reading difficulties, if you look at early elementary, that's this here, K3, or upper grades, four to nine, and you look at student outcomes, whether they're measuring comprehension, reading fluency, word reading, or spelling, you will see that in the elementary grades, the effect sizes vary from about 0.34, which is quite strong, all the way to 0.56 for word reading when appropriate research-based treatments are provided. And this is based on a number of studies, as many as 53 studies. So it's not just one study. However, look at the change of effect sizes, the impact when we look at upper grades, that is grades four to nine. What we see there is very low impact on comprehension, fluency, modest impact on word reading and spelling. And I would argue that the reason these impacts on comprehension are low is because when we get to the upper grades, background knowledge, the essential feature that improves reading comprehension is inadequately considered as we develop our instruction. So let me sort of unpack this a little bit in terms of the way I think about it. So when I think about intervention components for students in grades three, four, and above, I think about each of these columns as having to have a significant influence and be woven, as in Scarborough's rope, together. So you have to have serious word study, even as you enter third, fourth, fifth grade. Now this word study shifts. It may focus more on morphology. It may fo focus more on multisyllable words, et cetera. We also have to consider students being able to read, you know, efficiently, effortlessly. We also have to consider stretch text. And by stretch text, I'm referring to that text that is difficult for students. It's text that is probably at their grade level or above, even when they read below grade level. And you may say, oh, I've always thought we only expose students to text that's at their level. We do not provide them with text above level. And when you are in small intervention groups, I would argue that stretch text, which is content focused, typically informational, 
and focuses on building and extending background knowledge. So how do I do that? What I like to do is if students are reading in the content area, something about um, cells in science, that stretch text, I like to build by starting with easier text that's related to the stretch text and then building up to the more difficult text. That way you build the background knowledge at the same time you're uh, preparing a, the students to read more challenging text. I think that self-regulation is the way in which students learn to monitor and uh, set goals for themselves during their reading. And they can use self-regulation around uh, background knowledge as well. And then there's essential words such as academic words and text-based discourse that help students really prepare. So intervention examples that um, go with, for example, word study is I was talking about how we're preparing students with the background knowledge, but they have to actually know what the words are and what the words mean. And so I'm sure most of you teach a lot of high frequency words as well as vowel combinations. I know you know this, but I'm gonna remind you, the most challenging thing for students is vowels, particularly vowel combinations. So whether the vowel combination is an R controlled vowel as in birthday or overhaul or bird song, or whether the vowel combination is AU or EA or OU, those vowel combinations, sometimes they're diphthong, vowel diphthongs are very challenging for students. And students' background knowledge will not adequately help them read unless they also have adequate word study. So here are some examples of the kind of vowel combinations and multisyllable words that we teach. Now, in addition to teaching students the structure of language, we work really hard to organize word lists that operationalize these um, vowel combinations and multisyllable word types. So students have a lot of practice and we organize them into word lists. And these word lists are posted on our website so that you can systematically make sure students know how to read these words very quickly and automatically. And then you can use these word lists to determine which vowel combinations or sight word combinations the students need to know. So I talked about word study as it contributes to background knowledge, but also fluency. And with fluency, remember this, background knowledge contributes to students' fluency. So if a student has very low fluency with a passage, there are two possible explanations. One is around word reading. Can they read the words correctly and automatically? The second is around background knowledge. So for example, in Spanish, I, my fluency is considerably lower than it is in English, even though Spanish is a more transparent language. Why is that? It's because I lack knowledge of word meaning and background knowledge when I read in Spanish. So it slows me down. So remember, if students don't have adequate background knowledge when they're reading fluently, it will reduce the speed at which they read which is why as students get older, you will see a lot more bounce in their reading. And the explanation for that considerable bounce in their reading fluency with older students is because for many of them, they are reading passages for which they either lack adequate word reading or adequate background knowledge. You remember that I talked about stretch text. And so with stretch text, we talked about how we want students to read text that is more challenging than what they typically read. In this way, they learn to monitor and think about vocabulary, words they don't know. They get to identify key words that they don't know what they mean or they don't know how they fit into the background knowledge of what they're reading. 
And writing, whether it's summary or overall writing, contributes to their background knowledge, both before they read and also after they read. So I'm gonna take just a quick look here in the chat. Is there anything in the chat right now that I may need to respond to or a question that I might need to respond not to? At this, not at this time, uh, Dr. Vaughn, but I'll, I'm keeping my eyes peeled and, and encouraging people to ask questions. Oh, okay, thank you so much, Pam. Alrighty, good. Um, thank you for doing that because, you know, keeping my slides organized and also keeping the chat organized is maybe a half a step beyond my capability. Thank you. So for example, like if I was gonna apply um, background knowledge to this particular text, which for the students I was teaching is slightly above their reading area, uh, reading level, but I'm teaching a small group. And so in this small group, what I would wanna do is build background knowledge very quickly. Now, guess what the most common way teachers use building background knowledge? They say to students, for example, the two Harriets, heroines of abolition, what do you think this story is about? Or what do you think the text we're reading is about? They ask the students. I would argue that that is an inadequate way to build background knowledge prior to reading. And the reason it's inadequate is because you are asking people who haven't read the passage and likely know a limited amount, if any at all about it, to start guessing. And I think getting students to guess before they read is a very bad idea. And the reason it's a bad idea is because you can't correct and fill in all the misinformation. And before you know it, you have students who are all over the place and they're guessing things and then they're getting confused. And now rather than building background knowledge to help with the text, you're building inaccurate information that interferes with the reading of the text. So try this strategy instead. Try picking all the proper nouns that are in the passage. So in this passage, it would be Harriet's, Harriet Beecher Stowe, Uncle Tom's Cabin, America. And so it would go something like this. We're gonna read something today. And it is about two people named Harriet. That's why the title of this is called what? That's right, it's called The Two Harriets. Okay, Harriet number one is Harriet Beecher Stowe. And you can see her in the third line in your text. See if you can find that Harriet Beecher Stowe. That's a person's name. The second Harriet this is about is in the fourth line. And this person's name is Harriet, can you see her last name? Two syllables, first syllable is that's right, tub. Second syllable is, that's right, man. Put it together. What have you got? Yeah, her name is Harriet Tubman. So that's what I mean. You involve and engage the students, but you teach key words to help students build background knowledge before they read. No more than three minutes, four minutes. And that will help students read the text with greater comprehension and greater mm -hmm. confidence. So the stretch text here also focuses on building the polysemantic nature of our language. So in this particular text, the word flee is featured. What is the meaning of flee as it's used here? That will help build background knowledge. So let's find the word flee. So flee is in the fifth line. Let's read that sentence. It starts with there. Let's see how it goes. Let's read it as a group. There is some evidence of a mini underground railroad in South Texas that was largely fueled by poor Tejanos who helped runaway slaves flee into Mexico. What do you think flee means in that sentence? So those are ways we build background knowledge before students read. And remember, the important thing is that we wanna enhance knowledge of key words and key ideas. We can't build background knowledge related to everything they read. 
So another intervention example is with critical reading, we want students to engage in reading the text using a reading routine that builds background knowledge and comprehension. So for example, one of the things we do a lot of is we have students read a passage and then we have questions that they respond to. They can do that through either turning and talking or writing their response. In these cases and in these ways, students use the text that they're reading as a source of both their background knowledge, but also a way for us to determine whether they're monitoring their comprehension. Another way we build comprehension using background knowledge is we focus a lot on getting students to, if you will, click in while they're reading. And what I mean by click in while they're reading, it's that we want them to realize that when they're reading, oddly enough, most of you already know this, but the text needs to make sense. Many of the students we work with just plow through text. They don't really seem to care whether it makes sense. All they care about is getting finished. But the essence of reading is really grappling with text and, and integrating what we already know, our background knowledge, with what the author's telling us so it will make sense. One of the ways I have been organizing instruction for students is to develop practices called Does It Make Sense? And in the Does It Make Sense practices, we ask students to read either sentences, multiple sentences, or paragraphs, and to ask themselves whether what is written makes sense, and if it doesn't make sense, to find the word or phrase that doesn't make sense and to change it. So for example, in the first uh, example provided on my share screen, it says, my name is Samantha and I love to swim. It's my favorite book. Swimming helps me relax and is a good activity for my health because now I have muscle strength, a healthy heart and healthy lungs. I took classes when I was a child so that I could become a great driver one day. Now, does this, do these sentences make sense? And in this case, the answer is no. So then the next thing the student would do is underline the words that don't make sense. And in this case, in the first uh, line, in the second sentence, it says, it is my favorite book. Well, you would underline book and you would ask students to write in what would make sense. So they could say, it's my favorite sport, it's my favorite thing to do, etc." And so, um, and in this case, there's also another part that doesn't make sense in the last line when it says, I could become a great driver one day. Well, driver doesn't make sense. So they would underline that and they would replace it with swimmer. Now, one of the reasons I like doing this is because first of all, students love it. These does it make sense activities of which I have about a thousand. Um, you can do them in content areas like social studies or science. You can do them in language arts. Students love them. They think it's a fun game. Secondly, it gets students to realize that text is supposed to make sense. And that if you don't know a word, you can't just skip it or substitute another word. You have to actually read every word and you have to read it correctly because otherwise it won't make sense. And so we find this particular activity, it both helps to build background knowledge, but it also gets students to start making sense of what they're doing. Another component that we think is quite important is the idea of self-regulation. And with self-regulation, we want students to sort of monitor, plan for, and think about what they know. It's, it's really a function of goal setting, self-monitoring, and self-reflection. And so with goal setting, we want students to be first provide students with a process to meet the goals. So we can set goals around what they're reading, we can set goals about their background knowledge, we can set goals around their writing. And they explicitly provide feedback and gently we release responsibilities so that all of the responsibility around self-regulation is transferred from the teacher 
to the student. So here's an example in which the goals are to find the keywords, connect the keywords, and to stop and think. And at the end, the student has a little stop sign with some emojis that help them decide how they're supposed to manage that. Then at the end of the task, the student is asked this question, how well did you understand the passage? So rather than the teacher always being responsible for asking the questions, students monitor their own understanding and make a decision about it. And they also make decisions about what they didn't understand by underlining parts of the passage that are confusing. The other question thing we like to do as part of self-regulation is to get students to appreciate that they need to consider the questions that they answered and to determine whether they believe they're answering them correctly. Again, the idea is to get students to stop, think, and reflect, rather than all the responsibility being on the teacher. And here's an example of self-regulation when we're teaching main idea. In this example, we have taught students to get the main idea by determining the most important who or what and the most important thing about the who or what so that they have a practice for determining main idea. When they do that, we ask them at, to self-regulate whether the main idea sentence that they have constructed includes the most important who or what. Reread your sentence, yes or no. Does my main idea passage include the most important idea from it? Yes or no. Did I use a complete sentence? Do I have a capital letter? Do I have a period? Do I have nouns and verbs to make for that complete sentence? So these intervention practices around self-regulation really move responsibility from the teacher to the students so that they reflect and set goals about their learning. Another essential practice is essential words. I think I mentioned earlier that when we think about background knowledge, we think about the fact that the best marker for background knowledge is vocabulary. So I said, I started the session by saying, if you wanna know whether students have adequate background knowledge about what they're reading, the best way to determine that is to select critical words or what we refer to as essential words and to ask students to tell you about those essential words. Briefly speaking, that will tell you what, whether students have adequate background knowledge for what they're reading. We like to explore high utility, high frequency concepts to make sure that students can build the background knowledge they need before they read. So for example, the two constructs I have identified here for building background knowledge are both related to some work that we're reading in science. The first one is the word interact. The second one is the word ecosystem. We use these key words and use a picture so that students can get the idea of the key word we're using. So let's go to the second one. Let's go to ecosystem. A very quick description of ecosystem is that it's a community of organisms that live and interact in a particular area. So that's why we pre-taught the word interact or talked about that construct. Related words. In other words, there are so many words students need to know in order to build background knowledge and to comprehend what they read. We think it's important to teach all the related words too, like ecology, environment, and habitat then providing an example of how you would use ecosystem. So rainforest ecosystems rely on tropical bats to pollinate flowers and to disperse seeds for trees and shrubs. It's also cool to talk about examples and non-examples and to give students a chance to turn and talk so that they can use the term ecosystem. So you explore the high utility words that are related to the background knowledge and you review the words with follow-up activities. These academic words can also be taught in context. So for example, the essential word for today is persist. Persist is a verb that means to continue to, oops, sorry about that. 
uh, that, to continue to do something despite opposition. We will see re words that relate to persist, such as persisted, persistent, persisting, persistence. Hmm. Must you persist in making that noise? If he persists in studying each day, he's sure to pass the test. She persistently volunteered at the shelter until all the dogs were adopted. Now, look for the word persist and its relatives as we read. Underline them, and then we're going to talk about how, what they mean. So that was a very quick introduction. The key word is featured. The key word is featured as building background knowledge. And then we read text that relates to it. So these text-based discourses can also be integrated into essential words, such as whole class discussion, turn and talk, or underlining the essential words. So Pam, should I pause now or should I just keep on going? No, there are some questions, Dr. Vaughn. Um, first question, uh, do teachers teach background knowledge differently for a narrative versus a nonfiction or is it topic based? That's the first question from Lisa. Oh, I, I actually really like that and I wasn't expecting that question, um, but it's a really important one. The answer is yes, they do teach background knowledge differently, or at least um, I would encourage them to. And uh, they teach it differently in information text or hybrid text. So I'm gonna focus on that first. Information text, of course, is like nonfiction, typically represented in texts like science, et cetera. Hybrid text is text like biographies. In other words, it might have a narrative structure but it has a lot of information. So hybrid text and information text, we teach uh, background knowledge much like I did earlier with proper nouns and with key words and with very quickly building uh, associations around the background for what they're reading. So narrative text is different because narrative text is usually about a story it's not usually about information because I put biographies and information texts that are hybrid texts with information texts. And the background knowledge for um, uh, narrative text is often around not just keywords, but often around uh, inferences. Inferences are very important to narrative text. And a lot of the students we teach have trouble with inferences. And they particularly have trouble with pronomial uh, reference. So things like him, it, his, er, they don't know what it refers back to. So I do teach it differently. And I regret that I don't have a whole series on how to teach inferencing, but I have developed one. And maybe in the future, I can do a presentation that focuses on how you use inferencing to build background knowledge and to enhance comprehension. We would love to have you come back and do that for Patton. <laughs> oh, great. <laughs> okay, um, of course, when you mentioned that you had a thousand does it make sense passages, um, everyone's ears perked up. And so the question is, are they available for purchase or, and, or to access in any way? <laughs> oh, great. Thanks, Pam, for asking that question. And I really do have a thousand. So here's what I'm trying to do, all you people out there. Um, I really want to organize all my does it make sense passages in a uh, uh, book or booklet or in a organizational schema so you can have it. And I wanna organize them from the simple to the more complex. And I wanna organize them based on whether the word in the passage is a noun, a verb, an adjective, whether there's multiple mistakes. I wanna organize them based on simple meaning like phrases with does it make sense to complex meaning long paragraphs. So I, I have literally hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of these that I've used in my intervention studies, but I just haven't taken the time to organize them all into a format that I can share with you. But I do have, if you go onto our website, which is www, that's easy to remember. And it's two words, Meadows Center. So it's M-E-A-D-O-W-S-C-E-N-T-E-R.org. If you go on to meadowscenter.org, we do have, um, oh, I'd say we probably have 30 or 40 of them and that will get you started. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I'm sure everyone's very excited about when your book will come. Um, 
last question so far. Uh, what are some examples of keywords in a passage? Oh, what a great question. So, I mean, you know, first of all, if you had 20 super smart, super thoughtful people all reading the exact same passage, and you said, I want you each to decide what the key words are that need to be taught. Even when you have 20 super smart people in the same room, they don't agree. It is very hard, but I'll tell you how I decide. So don't worry about it. It's kind of what I'm saying. But how I decide is I always pre-teach proper nouns because proper nouns can drive kids crazy. I mean, all of a sudden they're reading about this um, uh, uh, person named Tchaikovsky, but they can't read the name and it's taking place in Warsaw and they don't know that Warsaw is a city. And then all of a sudden the, um, uh, uh, there's an invasion from Germany. They don't know, you know. So if you teach these proper nouns, it really helps orient students. Secondly, with essential words, there's, as I said, no right answer. I don't know either. I look at the passage and I say, I can't teach everything. I have to teach something. I'm going to teach two or three of the critical words that I think, number one, are essential to understanding what they're reading, but number two, have some legs. What I mean by has some legs is that there are words that the students will use again. Okay, I think that's all for now. Thank you so much, Dr. Ron. And also there's a lot, I'm sure you haven't been able to, to notice, but there's a lot of thanks uh, and um, talk about how they're going to um, use these ideas in their classrooms next year. So thank you so much for that. Oh, Pam, thank you so much for telling me that. It, that just cheered me up. You know, you never know when you're doing these Zooms. I'm sitting here talking to my computer and I have no idea whether people are nodding or falling asleep or making their list for grocery shopping or cooking their dinner or whatever. But anyway, thank you. That makes me feel good. I can see them and they're all attentive and excited and, and grateful. <laughs> oh, wonderful. Thank you. All right. I'm cheered up. I'm ready to go. So, um, as I said, I've done more than 40 studies um, integrating critical features of background knowledge into um, a robust intervention for students with significant reading problems. And so I'm gonna share just some of the findings uh, from that work so you have a sense of it. Um, basically, um, what I think is important is that in our treatment condition, um, and in our comparison condition, all of the students got reading instruction and all of the students got reading intervention. So we're not comparing students who got reading intervention with students who got no intervention. That would, um, that is not the state. All of the students got it. It's just that the ones that were randomized to our treatment condition got the treatment that I just described to you. And what we know is that the group of initial responders outperformed other struggling readers, even though they were no longer participating in the intervention. So they maintained effects all the way to the end of the second year. Treatment students outperformed students in the business as usual condi condition with a hedges G of 026, which is um, uh, favorable and uh, statistically significant. The rate of progress in the treatment group was less variable. In other words, the BAU or business as usual or comparison condition had much more variation than the treatment condition. And if you consider standard score points with uh, the standard score being um, 100 and the standard deviation being 15, you'll see that the students in the treatment condition improved their standing on decoding, fluency, and on reading comprehension. So an additional study, um, we worked with 481 fourth graders with reading difficulties, all provided the intervention that I had presented to you earlier. And we were um, in, interested in how different levels of word uh, reading influenced their final score. Excuse me a second. So if you look at word reading, and it, you look at students who have very low word reading. So for example, on the tower sight word, their word reading at the beginning of the intervention was 60. That is more than three standard deviations. These are very, very low readers. Now look at students who have still what everybody would consider low word reading. They have 77, it's still quite low. And then you have students who have near adequate word reading at the level of 90. 
And then you look at their um, uh, response to the treatment. I find it so interesting that word reading is such an excellent predictor of students' response, even to robust treatments. So if you look at their reading comprehension scores, based on whether they were very low readers, low readers, or near adequate readers, what you can see is that their hedges G is very related to where they fell on that scale. Look, for example, at the gates McGinnity reading test for reading comprehension. If you look at these students that were near adequate word readers or low word readers, their hedges G is almost 1.22 or 99. That's extremely high. If you look at their TOSREC scores, again, 1.00. So what we've learned is that even with background knowledge being an emphasis, even with word reading being an emphasis, even when we're really targeting students with reading difficulties, an excellent predictor of how students will respond is how they started off. Very, very low word readers end up with post-test scores that are also low. However, if you look at the gates McGinnity Reading Comprehension Test, this straight line here, the dark solid line are our very low readers. And you can see that on reading comprehension, they do not make the progress anywhere near as good as the low are very, are near adequate readers. And so we can only build so much background knowledge. And that's why, if you remember, I said to you at the beginning of this talk, that in addition to all of Scarborough's wonderful components of skilled word reading, and in addition to the focus on background knowledge, it's extremely important to keep in mind that how students will become better readers is by reading. Practice with feedback is a powerful mechanism. So I share with you on another reading comprehension measure, TOSREC, again, Look at very low word reader scores over time. Now look at low word reader scores over time, the dots. Now the dashes, the slope, the highest slope is for near adequate word readers over time. So I wanna talk a little bit now about the role of reading and discussion as we think about including um, reading comprehension and background knowledge in tier one instruction. And I say that to you because I am confident that as much as I want the students with reading difficulties to have strong, powerful interventions, I am beginning to realize that these interventions, while necessary, are not sufficient. We need teachers to have these dual goals of content knowledge and comprehension in order to reach text-based comprehension. And these text-based content approaches have to be integrated throughout tier one instruction. They have to be part of social studies, science, as well as other instructional units. Because we know that if we do not include content in the text as a vehicle for instruction, students will make inadequate progress. So let's look at the text reading in the content area. Oops, sorry, I have to go backwards. If you look at um, no text reading in science, so this is based on teacher observations of teachers uh, instructing in the area of science. And if you see the dark bar here, all the way to the line with the light bar of yellow or goldenrod, you can see that about 85% of teachers when teaching science do not use text reading. If you look at social studies, about 90% do not use text reading in the content area. So I say to you, unless we have students integrating text reading throughout tier one instruction, there will be inadequate progress. Also, they can't build background knowledge. 
knowledge because the way you build background knowledge is through understanding and practice, not just through listening comprehension, that's one mechanism, but it's inadequate. We also need to use reading. And so we really need to address both goals, not just content knowledge, but comprehension presented in text. And the mechanism that we use for doing that is what we call PAC. And PACT stands for Promoting Academic Comprehension Through Text and Background Knowledge. Here's a couple of studies, but there's a number of them. And we do this, for example, in social studies and science. And we embed it reading interventions that are aligned with the content area text. So that we actually, much like Scarborough, I used yarn because Scarborough already took rope but we weave together intervention, cognitive processing, motivation, and reading engagement in order to create a component called PACT. And we do that through comprehension canopy, explicit vocabulary instruction, text-based classroom discourse, team-based learning, and team-based learning with knowledge acquisition. So for example, like a life science sample lesson, we would have a springboard to introduce prior knowledge or background knowledge. This springboard would be just a couple of minutes and would really be engaging. It would say pictures, a brief video, less than a minute or two, or an opportunity for students to read a text um, that was created as a background for what they're about to read or learn. We use a lot of pictures to help students build background knowledge and to identify those essential words that will help students understand both the content of what they're learning as well as prepare for reading some of the text. We think it's important to have a procedure that helps promote this background knowledge and content reading. And this procedure includes comprehension checks along the way. So students read short passages, and the team of either two, three, or four students write explanations for what they're reading so that the focus is both on content and on reading. And you can see that we do this in a very systematic and organized way. We also have the application of the team-based learning through activities such as this game that focuses on, in this case, history or social studies or the American Revolution. This bit brings the background knowledge to life and also prepares students to read for understanding. We have done seven or eight randomized control trials, the most rigorous design, examining PACT, promote the intervention I just described to you, in tier one classrooms as a mechanism for both teaching background knowledge as well as enhancing knowledge of the content, as well as improving comprehension. In these studies, we randomly assign teachers' classes to either PACT or what teachers usually teach for social studies and science. And you'll see that we have had, at this point, we've done multiple studies. We have more than 5,000 students. We now have something like 12,000 students over multiple studies that have uh, participated in a packed treatment. And you can see here, um, the, each of the components, comprehension canopy, essential words, knowledge acquisition, team-based learning, and team-based knowledge acquisition. And the results from these studies in terms of content knowledge or the background knowledge are all significant, statistically significant, using a robust measure of content knowledge. You can also see that in the samples in which we only focused on the struggling readers in those classrooms, not just typical or advanced learners, PACT was associated with improved knowledge as well as improved comprehension. So to highlight the critical features, even in heterogeneous classrooms, even when we have high achievers, typical achievers, and students with significant reading difficulties, all students improve on content knowledge, comprehension, and broad reading comprehension when they are participating in the PACT intervention. So as heterogeneity increases in the classroom, I have a study, which I'm about to show you, that 
demonstrates that when you have increased in, um, proportion of struggling readers in a classroom, what I mean by that is if you have 10% of the students that are struggling readers in the class as emphasized by bar number one versus 90% of the students with who are struggling readers, that's the proportion of struggling readers in the tier one classroom. What you see is that when that proportion goes beyond 40%, you get a decline in overall performance. In other words, the heterogeneity in the tier one classroom, meaning you have some strong readers, some typical readers, and some students with reading difficulties, once the number of students with reading difficulties gets beyond 40% of the class, the overall performance in terms of content acquisition and reading comprehension, when they participate in PACT, declines. And this is really true in terms of struggling readers as well as typical readers. And so what I want you to see is for each 10% increase in the proportion of struggling readers in a tier one class, the post-test scores decreased by 0.78. However, all the way up to about 30 to 40%, all of the students benefit. It's only when a disproportionate number of the students that are represented in the classroom are struggling readers. So what are some of the conclusions? PACT, it's, PACT is effective in general education content area classrooms, tier one instruction. PACT is effective among struggling readers, including those in content area classes. PACT is a text-based, discourse-based intervention that requires facility with language use and an interaction between proportion of struggling readers in the class and student outcomes. So we are now doing a study exploring the effects of PACT and sustaining those effects across more than 40 different school districts in the United States. And I happen to know the effects of that study, which is that they're statistically significant and in favor of PACT, even when they are done as a form of scale up. So as we think about background knowledge, as it re relates to Scarborough's um, uh, uh, rope, I wanna call to your attention that improving reading comprehension will only occur when we consider both word reading Students need to know how to word, read the words as well as word meaning or background knowledge. If we were going to organize a platform, a set of guidance for you, both in your classroom and your school and district as a whole, I will give to you what I think that platform should be. Platform number one, organize vocabulary and concept development across content areas, not just during intervention, Provide in platform two purposeful peer interaction, either organizing structured peer pairing, small group work, or team-based learning. Number three, remember I said about more practice? If students are reading less than 10% of the time in social studies or science and other content areas, they are unlikely to make adequate progress. We have to have more practice we have to increase opportunities to use text as a source of word reading and background knowledge throughout the day. Self-regulation is an important element and needs to be integrated across content area instruction. And never forget the foundation skills. I know I was supposed to talk about background knowledge, but hugely important is that word reading is the pathway to reading comprehension and word meaning and background knowledge is the pathway to reading comprehension. So my takeaway message to you is that in order to significantly improve reading comprehension, you need a school-wide platform like the one I suggested. You also need ongoing intensive interventions focused at the word level, but ones that build background knowledge and noteworthy. I know you know this, but I had to say it. All students with reading problems are not the same. Students with near adequate word reading respond very well to interventions and may not need extensive intervention. And students with very low word reading are likely to need extensive and customized interventions. So with that in mind, 
consider, I have a couple of questions for you to think about. One is considering the significant role of background knowledge in promoting reading comprehension, how can we adequately measure students' background knowledge, particularly considering that background knowledge is so tech specific? And my second question for you is, what are some of the ways in which we can prioritize background knowledge so as to better advance student success in understanding and integrating text comprehension. Thank you so much for allowing me to be part of your group. I consider it an honor to be here and I'd like to celebrate with you Scarborough's rope, particularly background knowledge. So I had two questions for you, if any of you wanna to try to answer them or I'll be happy to answer your question. Okay, here we go, Pam. <laughs> I do have questions and I'll, I'll keep looking through the chat, but I do have a few right in front of me right now. Uh, of course, uh, folks are interested in knowing um, how they might access PACT. Um, is, this, is it research, uh, is it available or is it research developed and um, unavailable? Yeah, we're, we're just, I mean, I know I keep saying this and I feel kind of guilty. We're really close to releasing it. We just finished our effectiveness trial. We did six efficacy trials. We now have an effectiveness trial. We're just really getting ready to release it, but you can see sample lessons. I don't have, I can't release the whole program yet until we finish this study, but there's sample lessons on www.meadowcenter.org and the sample lessons will give you a lot of information. Awesome. Um, from Kimberly, it seems that PACT helps students understand how to prioritize and connect the volumes of information that comes at them during a lesson. Is this true? Oh, what a good insight. That's mm -hmm. really part of it. I mean, you know, um, you saw that only 10% of the time students are actually using text. So what we see, believe it or not, even as early as fourth grade and fifth grade, but certainly all the way through school uh, after that is sort of that sage on the stage mentality. So you're absolutely right. And thank you for calling that to our attention. Thank you. Um, Gail asks, if students are using stretch text and the struggling readers are multiple grade levels below students, excuse me, multiple grade levels below actual, sorry, let me start over. If students are using stretch text and the struggling readers are multiple grade levels below actual grade level, how do you successfully get students to read, decode the text for comprehension instruction versus listening comprehension? Yeah, no, that's really good. Thank you, because I need to clarify something. I only use stretch text with students who are struggling readers in small groups of five or fewer. In those conditions, I scaffold and prepare and support students. I also tell them, this is gonna be really hard. I don't expect you to read it perfectly, but I want you to know that when you are confronted with text that is too difficult, you have tools you can use to uh, uh, attack this text in ways in which you can discern meaning. And so I use it as a way to help prepare them, but only in structured, sheltered ways. I hope that makes sense. Thank you. Um, question, is PAC set up as a template that could be applied to any curriculum? Um, we have used it only in social studies and science. And yes, we believe it can be used across the content area. It is not content area specific. And I don't know why it would be pertained to any particular curriculum. The most important thing is that teachers need to be willing to use text at least three times a week in, um, as part of their social studies and science instruction. They don't have to use it the whole time, but they have to be using it about 20 minutes a day, three times a week. Okay. Um, I would like you to just take a moment, if you don't mind, Dr. Vaughn, just to look through the chat because there's so much gratitude and thanks uh, if you want, while I'm bringing oh, up to that. I, I, I really do want you to do that because there's so much uh, gratitude there. I really do want you to see that. Oh, I, that makes me feel so good. I'm looking for some <laughs> love. I'm, um, well, there's I, lots there. <laughs> I, I thank you. I really appreciate that. Um, and all of your kind uh, statements, Megan, thank you, Carly. Susan, um, I really mean that. Um, it is, you, you probably could imagine this because you've been teaching to a computer yourselves, but when you see really nobody and you just are staring at your own slides and you're talking, you feel like, oh my gosh, this is really boring. This could even be not very good. Um, so thank you for that. It makes me feel a lot better. 
not boring at all. It's so uh, valuable information and such uh, grounded in such research. Thank you, Dr. Vaughn. We're, we are so honored that you joined us for the series. And before we started tonight, I did ask Dr. Vaughn if she would join us for the Patent Literacy Symposium next year. As you know, Patent does conduct a pretty uh, wonderful, in my opinion, uh, literacy symposium every two years. And she's agreed to uh, join us for the symposium. And we will twist your arm as well for that inferencing session. <laughs> so we would oh, be yeah. honored to have I, you back. I want to do more work on inferencing. And, you know, I agree with you, uh, who is it? Dr. Oh, who is it? Oh, I lost it. Somebody said that that they liked the dims that doesn't make sense. And I really mm -hmm. am working on that. I've got to stop talking and doing these conferences and start working. <laughs> I'm sure you're working very hard. We all are. Um, so what I'm going to do here in just a moment, for those folks who um, are earning Act 48 for this uh, series, um, I will place the uh, link for you to complete the form so that you can um, indicate that you were here this evening. It's really important if you haven't yet placed your full name um, by your uh, video screen to do that. All you need to do to do that, if you haven't yet already, is to go up to the three dots in the corner of your screen right click and then just rename. You do have to have your full name, first name and last name for that. Um, okay, I have a question in the chat for me, but I'll, I'll look at that in just a moment. Uh, I do wanna remind you that our next session is July 27th. We'll be focusing on vocabulary with Dr. Susan Newman. Uh, we really hope that you can join us for that. Remind you as well that this information is on the Padlet. The recorded sessions are on the Padlet as well as a, the PowerPoint presentations related to each presentation. I will do my very best, uh, I know it's a holiday week or we're coming up on that, to have this recorded session turned around very quickly and placed on the Padlet as well. And of course, I will push that out. As you all know, I'm pretty prolific on social media, pushing out information around the science of reading. Um, I, went, I saw one of my colleagues, Dr. Laura Moran from uh, Patton here. I would like to thank her for joining us as well as all of you on a summer June evening. Uh, we had over 230 folks joining us, Dr. Vaughn. That's quite something That's uh, in the summer. <laughs> Oh and my course, gosh. And of course, don't I want to thank guys, Don't you people have a life? Like, don't you, like, I had to lock my dog out of the room. I had to, like, keep people from coming in. I mean, it's terrible, right? Same here. Nancy uh, has her family there for the 4th of July, and I'm on vacation with four of my six grandchildren. So, yes, the door's locked here, but uh, it was wonderful, uh, Dr. Vaughn. Really so informative and lots of application. Thank you so much for that. And thank you, Nancy Hennessy, for partnering. Uh, with me in this series. It's been such a wonderful series and we've all learned so much and we still have so much more to learn. So well, I'm Pam and Nancy, let me close by thanking you and everybody is on vacation. I'm getting all these great like messages. I'm on vacation too, but I had to do this. You, you, you all are amazing. You inspire me. And I'm not kidding when I say that. I am fully inspired. I came into this session wondering uh, how it would go. And I'm leaving the session feeling like I ought to not have dinner and instead work on putting my dims together into a book. <laughs> I think everyone wants you to do that, but we want you to have dinner too. Uh, doc, Dr. Vaughn is in California, but we will, um, we will be honored to have Dr. Vaughn joining us again and maybe by next summer. That would be really awesome, wouldn't it? everyone join uh, you? I'm so. getting to work. Okay. <laughs> All right. I will stay on uh, for anyone who needs assistance with the Act 48 information. Again, thank you all so oh, thank you very all much. So much. Have a wonderful summer evening. See you July 27th. Outstanding. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Thanks so much.